Amen. All right. That was kind of emotional. <laughs> and some of you got a lot of work to do with family members. Okay? But it's important. After all, we want him to do it with us. And what's, what's the nature of our relationship with our Heavenly Father is that he's always there. So what's the nature of you as a parent to your child? Does your child know you're always there? That's important. All right, so this is called the afterburn. So if you have comments or questions on today's teaching, you can raise your hand. Billy Jackson's going to grab the mic and bring it around. If you're on live stream, Rob Wyatt's going to take note of all of the comments and questions that you may have online. We'll start with the people here to give you guys online an opportunity to type in. Now, bear in mind, this is not an opportunity for those of you with different opinions to start preaching online or to start teaching online. This is an opportunity for the people online to make sure they understood what I said the way I intended it. Okay? This is not for argument and debate. You don't have to agree with anything I said. But the purpose of the afterburn is to make sure, th this is partially for me and partially for you. I want to be, I want to know that you understood the, what I taught the way I intended it. And so when you ask questions and make comments, it helps me understand that. And I want you to make sure that you understood it. And you can ask questions to make sure you understood it the way I meant before you decide whether you agree with it or not, okay? And we're going to try to keep it focused on just the teaching today, although I, don't, I did touch on a bunch of stuff, but all right, who's got the mic? Okay, go ahead and remind me who you are and say hi to everybody. Um, I, my name is Anna Uden. I'm from Missouri. I'm usually watching on live stream. Okay, welcome. Um, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. feel very blessed. Um, as I'll just introduce my husband. My name is Yaakov Uden. Okay, we have Yaakov and Anna. Okay. And we got a little one there, too. That's Ileana. Ileana, okay. Okay, I'm married to a Yuliana. We actually thought about that name. <laughs> there you go. All right, so um, I had a thought, and then if you don't mind, I have a question after that. Sure. So my quick thought was, um, to your curses are designed for blessing. I don't know the exact verse off the top of my head, but it goes like, he will do nothing that harms you, but only for your good. Yep, there's a verse that says that. And look, in the place where it talks about, and I will curse them seven times more, and he says that a few times, he says, look, if you are not instructed by those things, the curses are meant to instruct you to eventually bring around blessing, because he wants to bless you, but you force him to curse you until you get in line with what needs to be done to get the blessing. So that was a good verse to bring up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what's your um, question? And then my next question, it had to do with, um, you made a comment about like God not having emotions, human emotions. Um, so did, did we have emotions before the fall? And um, is God, is Satan using us through those emotions? Okay, so the, when I say he doesn't have human emotions, I mean from the negative point of view. He has emotions. He takes great joy in things. Okay, love is expressed emotionally. So I'm not against emotions. He's not against emotions. What he doesn't have is the negative driving emotions. So he desires us to be his and his alone. We call that jealous. But when you have jealousy as an emotion, it manifests in very ugly ways. His doesn't manifest in ugly ways. He just feels very disappointed and frustrated that in your going after others, you're only hurting yourself. When we're jealous, we're thinking that we're the ones being hurt. You see? So, it's, so he has emotions, but we want to ascribe human-type emotions to him, the human way of looking at things. And we're told to elevate up. The fruit of the Spirit are things that come out of love, joy, peace, patience. They all come and have an emotional content to them. But loving an enemy is not something that human, the human nature can normally do. If we think of love as an emotion to some degree, right? Okay? And so when you talk about the fall, I don't, you know, that's something that's more of a Christian term about using the fall as a thing of that and that. Look, we were created the way we were created so that we can go through the spectrum of things. I think that all of the emotions are always there in all created things. Even Hasatan, we see he's giving into the negative emotions. What we see in Elohim is that he is not one that gives into the negative side of the emotions. So it's not that he doesn't have them, he just doesn't allow them to drive. Does that make more sense? Okay, because all of the creation, including Hasatan, which was created as an anointed cherub, 
had those negative emotions. Envy, jealousy, wanting to elevate himself, to exalt himself. These all come from an emotional place. And so all of what we have is stuff that he has. He just has it under control and we don't. So when we read the word jealous, I'm just saying don't understand it from a human, ugly, emotional place. Okay, he's jealous in an appropriate way, desiring all of you only to, all, only to him and no one else because that's what's best for you. When we get jealous, we think about what's best for me, right? I'm thinking about, I'm jealous of, of your attention to someone else because I want your attention because it's what's best for me. He wants all your attention because it's what's best for you. See the difference? Okay. He grieves in his heart. He has the sadness emotion. He has the joy emotion. He has all of these emotions that we would have. So no, we were not created differently as far as emotions. But we have to learn to control the negative side of the emotion. Okay? Look, I'm going to use a terrible analogy, but use like a Star Wars analogy, right? You have the force, and then you have the dark side of the force. Right? Think of that more of like an emotional thing. There are emotions. Emotions can be great, but they have a dark side to them. What Yahweh has done is he has overcome all of the dark side of it. Okay? So all the emotions we have, he does have them, but he's not a human to have a human aspect of the emotion. The ugly, unproductive side of it. The self-focused side of it. The stuff that comes out of self all of his emotion comes out of selfless. Does that make sense? Did I answer the question? Okay. So now Hasatan's side of it is, yes, he absolutely takes full advantage of our susceptibility to be in the negative side, the dark side of the emotional spectrum. Okay. So absolutely Hasatan uses that to his best advantage. Because that is his best advantage, is to take, take our emotional part of our character, the negative part that we're trying to overcome, and use that to ramp up our desire to do things we shouldn't do. To get offended, to get upset, to lust after, whatever it is, you know, whatever we want or, or whatever we're rejecting in a wrong way, things that we should do that we reject, things that we shouldn't do that we desire, is all our emotional side that Hasatan absolutely is cheering you on. So I've been dwelling on chapter seven since Torah study. Um, something really spoke out to me. Um, it says that when he brings us into the land where we are to go to possess, he shall clear away many nations before you. And then he goes on and lists a bunch of nations that aren't really relative to us in this journey right now. We're not really going into a lot of nations nor being influenced by them. So is it, is it safe to kind of say that we go through life, we pick up a lot of lifestyles, habits, stages, things that were, you know, in, influenced by, um, and he wants to clear them from us. And then, okay, is you want that to comment given? on that first? You yeah. have more to say. Okay. All right, so let, let me just comment on that first. Look, in some ways they had it easier, in some ways they may have had it harder. We have to look at the perspective of it. They would travel through the land of the Amorites or the Perizzites or the Hivites and when they left, they left. We live in a land filled with all of them in one place. You can't go anywhere to get away from them. Do you understand what I'm saying? They could go through or disp dispossess them out of that land. We are now living in the melting pot. Any country you go to, so it doesn't matter where you live, I'm not trying to say America only, any country you go to is going to be a mix of all that exists. They all live, unless you go to some really isolated place that has been untraveled and nobody's really gone to, everywhere you go is a mixed everything. And so you're going to have the temptation because of the exposure to all of those other cultures, all those other thoughts, all those other beliefs. And then we just talked about technology and all of your children can pick up their phone and go to the internet or whatever device they're on and they can be exposed to every single possible idea, thought, and belief right there. Every lifestyle idea, every political idea, every cultural idea, every religious idea, every health idea, whatever it is, any aspect of their life, they can f access instantaneously 
those thoughts. It used to be that it would just be you'd walk into uh, somebody, you'd talk to them, and you'd be exposed to some of their thoughts and ideas because you'd have a conversation. Now you can get exposed to anything you want about any spectrum just right there on your device. You pick up your phone, there it is, boom. You go to the god of this world, Google or YouTube, and ask it. It's like the, it's like the magic guru thing or the magic eight ball. You can ask it anything, right? And they can be exposed to anything that you can think of right there. So in this section here, what you were talking about, yeah, they were going through this land that had all these nations, and they could actually continue to pass through those lands, or they could dispossess them like they were told to, but they were only exposed at that point. We're exposed 24-7. Everywhere we go, we're exposed to it. That's why it's such a great thing to have Shabbat, and you can get away from it, at least for a day. Mm -hmm. Right? And so for at least for a day, you can be isolated away from all of that. Okay, go ahead. So with that, it's really awesome that he loves us enough to give them over to us before he gets, like he wants to, to clear them from us before we get into the land. So it's, at the end, it says it's in his trust. Like he's got a covenant with us too. And Amen. He has work to do with those who are in the walk or in this covenant with him. So when you take it as, you know, he's doing his role by clearing these up. And is it safe to say, like, he clears them by bringing them to our attention? Because it says he's going to give them over to you. And you're going to put them under the ban. And you're going to... Um, and he, should, he tells you how to do it, which is really awesome. And something that kind of related to me was he said, you're the, but this is what you're going to do. Break down the slaughtering places, smash their pillars, and cut down their burned and carved Im images. And I just thought of it being like all these influences that have control over us and the things that we do and say or like how we are about what keeps us. You know, he's trying to clear it from us. He's trying to get us to possess the land. He's, I mean. And um, so we got to take down what we are offering ourselves over to. And we got to destroy the things, the pillars, like that's a support beam. Like we gotta take away the things that support that lifestyle or those habits or mindsets or cultures or influences. And we have to remove the visual images so we're not tempted into that. Amen. Amen. All right, who's next? Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the question about emotions because emotion has been the word that I have been dealing with this week because of um, the situation with my daughter. Um, you had also brought up during Torah study that emotion comes, and you used the word Zeus. And so there was a lot of confusion in my mind of what is appropriate for, for us in our emotion. Um, because I've heard you say, you know, that's too much emotion for that situation, or put your feelings in the bag. And so I'm trying to figure out where the balance is to have appropriate emotion when a joy happens. Um, I'm trying to understand with your words that balance because I, I look at Jacob when he saw his brothers he went away and he cried because of great joy of seeing them Joseph I mean not Jacob no no uh, look so, let, me, let me kind of answer the question I think I can do something the, the thing that I, I teach and instruct about emotions and I talk about the, the overflow or the feelings bag and everything is the negative emotions okay those that do not produce any kind of uh good, productive uh, results of any sort. Okay, your daughter, you know, contacting you, stirred up all kinds of joyful things, could have brought tears of joy or whatever kind of all the, that's nothing, let that flow, let that enjoy that. I'm talking about, though, when we can get angry, offended, um, saddened and disappointed in judging ways and those kind of things. Not the sadness that comes like from the loss of a loved one or something like that, but there's the negative, unproductive emotions that come from Self being offended, self being hurt in some way, self, um, in other words, you understand what I'm saying? Being about self. So it's about the balance and having your emotions, at least an awareness to keep them on, on control. Look, you have the manic depressive, right, who tends to have their emotions go very far one side, and then they can also go very far the other side, and they lose control, where it can be out of control over the top. Now look, you've seen some, scripturally, some real major expressions of emotion. Look at David coming into town with the ark. Mm -hmm. 
He's whirling and twirling and dancing, and I mean, he's, he's really letting it loose. And, and to his wife, he didn't look like he was under control. I believe he still was. I think he understood exactly what he was doing, was doing it within control. But he was fully expressing what he was feeling, okay? So I'm not saying anything that's negative about having emotions, okay? You should be emotional. We see people get very emotional about some of the things that happen in this room, okay? And some of the things they're hearing in the teachings and some of the chords that are being struck. It's the negative emotions that hurt you and those around you. Okay, and we are to be very careful not to let them drive. Okay, the jealousies, the envies, the lusts, the hurts, the offense, the angers, all these things that we let them drive, we end up in all kinds of problems. Okay, and this is the hardest thing that we have to deal with is finding our emotional balance. Okay, so I don't want you necessarily restraining your positive emotional flow. Don't restrain the joy, the, okay? Especially the joy that you have. The happiness and joy and the love, these things all have emotional aspects of, of these things. But they can be expressed in ways that can get you in trouble. And you have to have at least a, a you know, you always want to be in control, Okay, where at least you have some awareness that this is a time I can let loose up to this point and it's appropriate under the circumstances in the environment I'm in, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Go ahead, uh, yeah, uh, Ati. Hey, so um, just a little thing with the whole guarding his commands and how it's a blessing. Um, I didn't realize how much I didn't realize that because... I always kind of viewed the future as something to be hard because, well, today I turned 27, so praise y'all for that. But I, uh, thanks. <laughs> and I always um, thought like, oh my gosh, like I wonder how it's probably gonna be harder for me because I have so much time to go versus people who are, you know, older in this walk and not to say that we're gonna die soon, but I'm just saying like, there's a huge gap between where I'm at and then, I don't know how to describe it. But basically it's like, regardless, it's, it's still gonna be a blessing whether I do it or not. So I really just have to keep with guarding. And always and remember, then, it's your walk is your walk. True. Doesn't matter anybody else's walk. Some of them, look, some of them are looking at you saying, man, I wish I had gotten started at 27. Okay. Who's doing that? <laughs> you know. Okay. And, and then, so that's, oh. that's a big blessing. Thanks. And then another thing that I wrote was, um, what favor do I need to stop showing others at the expense of keeping the covenant? And um, this is sort of like a mini praise with coming into Torah earlier this year, or I guess end of last year, but actually become, like coming into MDOI, I started actually keeping Shabbat the right way and kind of let my family know what's going on. And before it was kind of like rocky, but even today, you know, we have this tradition with birthdays and I told them like, hey, can you guys just honor the fact that, you know, Friday sundown to, send to Saturday sundown won't really be talking to you guys until so. They like recepted that really well, so that's a good praise. Sorry good. my voice is shaky, I don't We're know. Good. Amen. Amen. All right, let me throw this in there because I think it's important. Look, the best, well, the best potential results you're going to get with your family when it comes to this walk is that you are relentlessly consistent. And they, they will, over time, even reluctantly, start to show you respect that, you are, that you're consistent. In other words... They may not like it, they still may give you grief about it, but they're always, but they're gonna at least get to the point where they know that all they're doing is venting, you're not going to change, okay? You have to be relentlessly consistent. So when they ask, and each time they ask, and they'll keep asking, because it's like the little kid going and poking at you because they want something, and they want something. They know if they keep poking at you, eventually you'll probably say yes. But you got to show them it doesn't matter how much poking and they're poking at you and they're po just, just the answer is still going to be I'm sorry but I can't do that I'm sorry but I can't do that I'm sorry but it's Shabbat I can't do that right and it's, if you are relentlessly consistent eventually they will get it that doesn't mean they won't ask you but then the next time they ask and you say by the way it's Shabbat they'll be like oh yeah I forgot or whatever and they won't 
Be surprised because you've been consistent. Okay? That is the key with your family members and friends, etc. Is you have same thing with your spouse. If your spouse is not on the same walk as you, but you must be consistent. Don't cross the lines. You cross those lines, they'll expect that there's more lines you can cross. Okay? Be relentlessly consistent. Be patient. Be gentle and say, look, I know you don't like what I'm doing, but I can't do that. The answer is no, I'm not doing that. I'm not breaking Shabbat. Just keep gently saying, be firm, but gentle, if you know what I'm saying. Okay? Don't move those lines. You move those lines, they get all blurry and you're in trouble. All right, who's next? I think I'm going to have a lot of questions I usually do on the live stream. Um, so you said something about in the latter days, um, everybody coming back into covenant. Does that mean all Christians or I know, to, I know you don't really like using that term. I'm not really sure what term to use. Okay. I'm listen to the teaching, discovering your identity and also listen to the teaching millennium and kingdom. It will explain all that. Okay. In the latter days, you know, there is a plan. Now, by the way, what I would have said also when, um, I don't remember if it was your question or somebody else asked, oh, it was um, uh, Esther when she was talking about the seven nations. Look, you know, that was a clearing out the land for them to go into. Now he's going to literally just pull us out of the lands that they're in and bring us to the land. Of course, there is a battle that's going to happen first and clear out the land, okay? But that's going to be a plucking out and bringing us there, okay? He says, I'm going to gather them from where I scattered them. Now, as far as the plan as to who gets in and how they get in and how that all works, I explained it in the Millennium and Kingdom teaching and in the Discovering Your Identity teaching, you know, to, to a big degree, okay? So listen to that first. If you still have questions, then you can, you know, call me, whatever you need to do, and I'll answer the question. Okay? Yeah, um, I discovered you um, about two months ago. So all right, so I'm really, really new. Okay, two months. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff to catch up on. Okay, so bear in mind that with my teachings... They're all designed to be everything that you need so that I can just point you to a teaching so that... But the thing is, when I teach, I'm expecting that you also know all of that stuff already. Like the one... That's why I quoted to you Fear of Yahweh teaching today and Are You Covenanted and Are You Saved and, and all these other teachings because you need those to understand what I was trying to tell you today. Of course, when you listen to those, I'll mention other ones that you need to understand those. <laughs> so you really need to understand all 500 of them and then you'll be in, in good shape. And the people laughing the loudest agree because they've had to do that, Okay. Okay, but what I will say is this. There's a plan, okay? And in that plan, all those that are willing in heart to come into covenant will be ultimately in the kingdom. How that plan plays out and how he implements it, I give you one of my, what amounts to my best guess in the teaching, okay? From scripture, how I think it plays out. He's not a respecter of persons. It is his desire that all men be saved. That's a verse that tells us that. We also know that not everybody will be. And so how is that determined? How does that work out? I lay that out in the teachings from the verses, you know, my best guess on that. So the Millennium and Kingdom teaching mostly covers that. Um, I may be redoing that here at some point in the future. Yes, Norma, I will be doing it. I know she's old. She wants that part four so bad. Um, I have it on my desk, I told you. Actually, we already passed the date, and I didn't do it. That was an April date on it, wasn't it? Okay. Anyway, Manny made me a part four fake CD, you know, for a Millennium Kingdom part four. <laughs> so I show everybody, here it is. There's nothing on it, but okay. Um, but uh, if you listen to that, I think it will answer the question you're asking. Okay, I will definitely listen to okay. that. I've been that one's only three parts, so it's, that's not a huge one for you. To, discovering identity is more, but not too big. I forget how many. How many is the new one? It was four originally. Does anybody know how discovering your identity? Is it 10? Okay, it might be 10. So That's those not are, bad. <laughs> those are relatively small. <laughs> I, I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I have a lot of time to okay. listen or watch. So, um, And then um, I was wondering if you could expand more on intermarrying. Um, I was with the baby, so I didn't catch that part, but um, I'm not going to get too personal, but um, my husband and I uh, were, I'm American, he's Russian, and it, his... The answer, it had nothing to do with that. Well, what I'm trying to say is um, his family, I've, we've been together for seven to eight years, dating, and then we married, uh, we've been married for four years now, and they still haven't accepted me, and um, they lean on kind of 
the same belief that you do. So I'm wondering, what do I say to them? Because they always come back with, well, don't be unequally yoked, or she, they just come up with excuses. So what can I say to them? Okay. Um, and, and Well, first, let me just, just go back to what I gave you with those other teachings. If you're going to have the time, listen to Discovering Your Identity first. Okay. Then listen to the Millennium and Kingdom. It'll make more sense in that order. Okay. As far as the intermarrying, what I made the point was that this, this is the type of verses that are used by racist people, whether they're racist in one direction or the other, doesn't matter. But it's not about race, okay? The intermarrying had to do with belief systems and leading away from Yahweh. It says, I don't want you to marry those that would lead you away from Yahweh. He says, don't lead, because if you let your daughters marry their sons or your sons marry their daughters, they will lead you away from me, is what he said. Okay? So that's the concern. The unequally yoked is the same thing to a certain degree, although unequally yoked, yoking is a discipleship term. In other words, do not be married to someone who's being discipled or taught by a different teacher. That teacher being either Yeshua or Yahweh, however you want to look at it. In other words, those that are in a different belief are going down a different walk. So don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, someone who doesn't believe like you believe. Two can't walk together let's say agree. Now, if his family is coming from a similar background to what I'm teaching, they should understand that as long as you're on the same page in your walk, you're not in an unequally yoked situation. And it doesn't matter if one of you is from Europe or one of you is from Russia or one of you is from America or one of you is from the Philippines or one of you is from whatever. It doesn't matter what country you're from. What matters is your covenanting. If you're walking the same walk, then you are not unequally yoked. You're equally yoked. The intermarrying was purely about covenant and being led away from Yahweh. Okay? Did that answer the question? Yeah, it did. I think it's just mostly cultural. Yeah, it's uh, a cultural thing. Look, there, there are absolutely racial, cultural, um, there is, call it, uh, you know, a nationalism or a patriotism, or whatever, that takes you to the point where I have this thing because I'm Russian or because I'm American or because I'm whatever. It doesn't matter. We can get caught up in that. And then we don't, we don't want to ruin the purity of, well, that whole deal or whatever, okay? Your nationality, if you're covenanted, is Israel. And not the one established in 1948, okay? You're na that's why you have to listen to the Discovering Your Identity teaching. Your nationality is biblical Israel. I don't care if you were Mexican, I don't care if you were Canadian, I don't care if you were American, I don't care if you were German or French or Italian, Chinese, Russian, it doesn't matter. Your choice makes you the same. You're Israel, scripturally, okay? And that's what matters. You are children of Abraham by choice. You are co-heirs in the promise by choice. You're grafted in Romans 11 by choice. And what you were born, like Ruth the Moabitess, was no longer a Moabitess when she made her choice to become an Israelite, okay? And so that's what you need to explain to them, okay? That they're buying into a nationalistic, culturalistic, whatever bias that's not scriptural, okay? But yet, white supremacists use it one way, black Hebrew Israelites use it the other way. Opposite extremes using the same verses to make the same stupid argument. Okay? I mean, that's what you really see. Both sides, completely opposite, hating each other, using the same verses to make their case. How stupid is that? Okay? But that's what they try to do. It is not about, and it needs to be clear, not about race, it's not about nation, it's not about culture, it's about choice. It's about covenant. Listen to the are you covenanted. That's long. That's 55 parts. Okay. It's a great series, though. So you really need to listen to that. But it's about choice. It's got to be understood. It's a relationship by choice. And when I see you have made the same choice, that makes you my brother or my sister. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what country you came from, what language you spoke, or whatever. We are now brothers and sisters because of covenant. Amen? And all the rest of that stuff is garbage and needs to be thrown out, okay? All the rest of that is pure, unadulterated garbage. 
Okay, Yahweh does not love one race more than another, one culture more than another. He loves Israel, and that's it. What he also says is that everybody can become Israel. The treasured possession is who? Israel. Held up above all nations, who? Israel. Are they a mixed multitude? Yes. They're not a pure line, a pure blood. It's not about genealogy. Yeshua tells us that. Old Testament tells us that. It's never been about genealogy. Once there was a nation, it was about being a part of that nation. Period. Nothing else. All right. Next question or comment. Uh, I tell you, these, these teachings are astonishing. You've got to keep it right oh. there. Right, All right, right in here. Andy. Right in there. Right, I got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's the way you get her done. Get her done. That's right, brother. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> I had to find a way to put that in there somewhere. But, well, I love it. <laughs> I okay. love it. There you go. Uh, they, these teachings are astonishing because I know where they come from. You know, I, I love it. Uh, I have a, a problem when I get excited, my mind goes blank. <laughs> so let me see what I got here. Uh, I yeah. see you got your old-fashioned notepad. That's right. That's right. I old won't school. lose that one. That's right. Old school notepad. Uh, I, I, I keep thinking about the things that led me here, and it's just so many things. And it, the one thing is my my children. I, I have a fascination with the truth. I said I want my children to know the truth. But I really didn't even know it myself. So I saw it for three years, day and night. And Yahweh, when he, because my daughter was always asking questions, daddy this, daddy that. And uh, I didn't really have the, the answers that I wanted to give her. And when Yahweh opened my eyes, I, it was a Hebrew roots thing that I saw. This is before I saw you on uh, YouTube. I said, Father, I, I said, I want to know the truth. And I mean, he opened my eyes. And I'm so excited. <clears throat> and then when I started, we, the next Shabbat, we had a little ceremony in our living room. We lit a candle, and I repented. I said, we, 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 we was coveted. I said, because this is the way we're going to go from now on, from this point. And... So, but with the churches we go to, you, know, you, you made a statement in one of your teachings just recently. It was so astounding to me when you said that, you know, you pointed to the people and said, you know, it's a miracle that you're even here. And I said, amen, brother. Amen. Because if you knew where I come from, I come from a sea of evangelicalism. Once saved, always saved. Grace. So... When Yahweh disturbed my peace, I, I come out of the church, our church, and we started visiting other churches, and I was really concerned. I said, because I told my wife, I said, something's wrong. I, I couldn't figure it out. And, but in my mind, I said, can all these be false prophets? I, said, I couldn't even say it out loud, so I started typing it in. Then I come to, uh, I was watching this guy, and I looked over here in the column, and I seen this guy in a blue shirt and black checker, and, and I said, hmm, I was listening to this guy, but I saw you over here, and I said, he looks like he knows what he might be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> So out of the blue, there you are. That's just good airbrushing and other things. Yes. And uh, so I, I wanted to have my shirt to match what was going on. But it was so astounding to me. I, I, I watched it, answered everything. I mean, I could even possibly think, and more. I oh, I know which one. That was the Beware False Prophet. That's exactly right. That's that was the, the one. I remember the shirt I was wearing for that right. one. Right. Okay. Yeah. There and, you I go. Want, and I would like to have one just like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, but, but that's what led me to it because my peace was just disturbed, disturbed and I knew that something was wrong. And then it just, and I said, I told my wife, you got to listen to this. 
you got to listen. And, and and when you get to the middle of it, you know, it's about the Jesus and and uh, it's so so true and it's so astounding. And she I, she couldn't hear it. I said I can't listen to this. I said honey, you got to listen to it. You know, and then when she got through it, it was just like, you know, Yahweh opened my my wife's eyes up with me. And uh, so, oh, hey. yeah. and, and my daughter, she don't, she don't come to me with the questions that she used to. She goes to the teachings, <laughs> which I'm fine with, because I tell you, I'm on the covenant one now, and I, uh, I mean, I, six, uh, eight months ago, I was talking to a friend of mine in my studio, you know, when I had come to this truth. And I was saying, and I'm going to tell you how ignorant I was. I thought the Torah was a different book. <laughs> I didn't even know it was the first five books. I said, I got to read the Torah. And he said, well, are you going to have time to do this project? And I said, oh, yeah. You know, but I mean, in five months' times, I have got hours and hours and hours of the teachings that uh, Elohim has blessed you with to, to teach us. I love following him because I love the truth. It excites me. You know, and I love Yahweh. I love the Father. I love following Yeshua. He He's our good shepherd. You know, and I, and I'm just so excited because you know, thinking of where we come from, it's a miracle that we found to be here. You know, and this is our fourth time here, so we and we love the congregation. Uh, and I had that similar situation with the church, too. I call it a congregation, too, because you, you explain things so well to me. And uh, I, the question this young lady was talking about, about between being 27 and having all this in front of you, well, you, and I'm in the opposite end. I'm at 60 <laughs> and just learned it four months ago. So, But anyway, I just want to tell you we love y'all, and we love being here and, and, and love you, Brother Rabbi. We just, I'm just so excited. I don't even know what to say. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And I appreciate Mark invented the new term, Brother Rabbi. <laughs> All right. We love having you here, and now you're not guests anymore. You see that? So now your family and your All right. Rob, go ahead. Yeah, the first comment I want to throw out, uh, Pete and Brenda Lamb, he said, Yahweh is the one father that you can never sneak out on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, from Olivia and Janet Hoffman. So Rabbi chapter 7, verse 3, wondering if it is okay to attend a mass wedding or funeral performed in a Catholic or other Christian church not on Shabbat, or is it better to just attend the reception afterwards? Yes, it's better to attend just the reception afterwards. Look, you know, you're not going to be comfortable once you figure this all out, being anywhere in a church, especially a Catholic church with all those rituals and all the other stuff. You'll feel weird just walking in the building. Okay, so don't go to the, if they're going to have a, look, if you're going to a funeral home, things are a lot easier, but if you're going to be going to a church for a funeral or, or wedding type of thing, I, you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. I'd rather just meet them for the reception or do what, do what needs to be done there. Pete and Brenda Lamb, so this question, if Deuteronomy 7, 12 through 13 is saying that Yahweh's love is condition on our obedience, is there any way in which his love is unconditional? Okay, so I think we're misunderstanding. His love is unconditional in that he loves us. He chooses to express that love in this way conditionally. Did you follow that? Okay, I love my children unconditionally. I will express that love differently when they're doing what's pleasing in my sight. So what he's trying to say that the expression of the love in the way that he has promised it comes from obedience. He loves you because he made you. He loves everybody because he made everybody. He's not always happy with what people are choosing to do. Okay? 
So hopefully we made that connection correctly. So his love is unconditional in that there's no condition that will separate you from the fact that he loves you. However, to receive this particular expression of love, that's conditional. Okay, for um, Maria Lawson, it says Deuteronomy 4, 29 and 30. When you are speaking of delusion of the world, is it my duty to correct and inform those who are delusional? Okay, I want you to think about the delusional part of the question. <laughs> See, because it's only in a delusional mindset that you think that you could actually separate anybody out of their delusion. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because then you're deluded, which is why I tell people to stop the church mindset of being an evangelical person that's out there trying to, you know, save souls and stuff. You know, go listen to the beginning teaching. This will be part of the stuff that was for you, if you haven't listened to it yet, called The Journey. The Journey starts the same for everybody. He, not you, pops open that delusion bubble and starts letting some air in there and some truth in there, and then you start actively seeking it. By doing what he said, he, was, he knew something was wrong. And how did I say it in the teaching? One of two things, or maybe both, are going to be true when your journey starts. You're either going to realize something's missing, or something's wrong, or both. And you're going to try to figure it out. That doesn't happen because somebody went over to you and said, by the way, do you know that in here it says Saturday's the Sabbath, and this, you shouldn't be doing Christmas and Easter? No, that's, or that you shouldn't eat pork? That's not going to pop anybody's delusion bubble. They know that's all in there. Their preachers are so afraid of this movement that they're getting actively preached against this. But they're, so they're being told this is out there. They know this is out there. Because Christianity is panicking that people might actually find this out and believe it. And they shouldn't be panicking because it's irrelevant. Nobody's going to believe it until he pops the bubble. So they're afraid of nothing. Because hearing about it hasn't changed any. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, heard all of this before you were ready and just ignored it? You all knew it was there. You've heard it before. But you were under the delusion that it was done away with, nailed to the cross, blah, 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 blah. So you just didn't, nobody was going to change your mind. Only he could open up, right? Listen to the Father and the Son teaching. In the beginning of that teaching, we made the argument for the Father has to reveal the Son and the Son has to reveal the Father. There are no exceptions. I can't reveal either one to you. Once they're revealed, I can help you understand and maybe see them more fully. The revealing has to come from him, though. They have to open up your eyes to see them correctly and then lead you to a teacher that could help you to see them more completely, whatever, okay? But no, you cannot accomplish that, what was in the, the way the person asked the question. So, no, it's not your responsibility. That responsibility is fully his. That's why I hold no judgment whatsoever for people in Christianity or any other belief system or no belief system. He allowed that to happen. Whether And, and I, I just gonna have to assume, to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, that very few of them have had their bubbles popped and they just chose to stay in the delusion. Okay? I'm going to believe and hope that it's a very small number of people that once they had their bubble popped, they chose to stay in the delusion. So therefore, I'm going to, if that's so much blame, I'm going to allow him have the, you know, it lays at his feet the problem of everybody that's still in the delusion. He will open up their eyes when he wants to at his time, and that is above my pay grade, it's not my problem. Okay? My problem is to work with those whose eyes are opened. All right? And hold no judgment on those whose eyes are still in the delusional state, in the, you know, filters through, the, through that delusional bubble. All right? He has allowed them to be there. That's his problem, not mine. He has a plan. I trust his plan that in his plan, his desire that all men be saved will allow for the vast majority to end up there and also allow that everybody will have that choice. That's where you need to listen to the Millennium and Kingdom teaching at, okay? Because that's where I explain how that choice comes about. But everybody gets that choice, my opinion. But that's based on all the things he says in the Word about not being a respecter of persons, desiring all men be saved, and all these other things. My opinion, Scripture maintains and mandates that everybody has their eyes open to make that choice at some point. We just don't know when that point is. Maybe during the millennium. I make a case for that during, in that teaching, okay? 
but it's not your problem to be afraid about them getting or not getting that choice. And so don't get all locked up in that thought process. And don't worry about all your family members that died as mainstream Christmas, pork-eating Christian, whatever's, okay? There's a plan, Yahweh's plan, and they'll get their opportunity if they haven't already. I'm not talking about second chances and all that other stuff. Listen to the teaching. Everybody gets one chance, eyes open. That's fair, isn't it? One chance, eyes open. Now, if the eyes aren't open, they haven't had their chance yet. Okay? Now, that needs to be something you fearfully consider, because if your eyes are open, guess what? This is your chance. You don't, you don't have anything else to look forward to. Okay? This is, this is where you figure it out or blow it. It's on you. So be excited, but be fearful. This is your time. That's why it says judgment is now what? On the house of Elohim, on the children of Elohim, right? The house of Israel. Judgment is now. It doesn't say judgment is now on everybody. Okay? Judgment is now on those whose eyes are open. All right? You can't hold people responsible for stuff they don't know and they can't see. But yet I'm still accused of, like, attacking church people. No. That system is a problem that has them in a lie. The, if anybody gets the blame for them being still in there, I blame the creator. I'm not blaming him. I'm saying he has chosen at this time to let them be there. Like he chose, look, 27, 60. So why did he make you wait till 60 and make you only wait till 27? Well, I don't know. That was his choice. He called you when he felt you were ready to receive it. Okay. Maybe you weren't ready at 27. I don't know. His choice. All you got to do is be happy. He chose it when he chose it. Okay? That's the miracle right there. And be happy he didn't make you wait till 70 or 80 or 90 or then maybe wait till the millennium. At least you get to do it now and get her done. <laughs> Let's get it done. I just think he sounds like that. What can I tell you? But he knows it too and has good fun with it. All right? But we have to get it done when we have our eyes open. Okay, so I don't want to pick on the person who asked the question, but you're still in part of the delusion if you think that you have any effect on anybody else's delusion. What normally happens when someone's delusional mindset is threatened? A violent response, whether it's verbal or physical. When you threaten someone's, that, that's clinical right there. That is a clinical definition. Generally speaking, people respond in very strong, often violent, either verbal or physical ways when you do something to threaten their delusion. Don't you see that? What happened when you told your church that you were moving out? Did you get a friendly, oh, that's wonderful? Have a, have a wonderful journey as you're walking out your salvation? Or did they curse you and say, the, well, the worst thing curse you, they said, I'll pray for you, brother. Okay? But they, or did they throw things at you on your way out and tell everybody that you were doomed and now you went, you're going straight to hell and you've given up your salvation and you're no longer under great? Didn't they say all that stuff to you? Why? Because you're, if you're right, you're threatening their delusion bubble. Otherwise, there's no reason for them to react that way. When people leave this, those of us that are not delusional should simply be sad and say, well, I hope they wake up some point and come back. They're not a threat to my delusional bubble. I'm awake. So now I realize they have their own choice. But if you're right, they're wrong when they're in the delusion bubble. So that's why your family members, your friends, everybody else gets so mad at you. Because somewhere in their system, their brain goes, if they're right, I'm wrong. And I don't want to be wrong. And I don't want to change. I like being in the once saved, always saved, that doesn't matter what I do place or whatever. All right? Because if you're right, I got to change. If you're right, I got to do something. If you're right, that messes up my whole belief system. At my Saturday tennis game, we actually had a guy like that. They used to not want to give up his Saturday. I'm serious. That was part of why he, he knew the truth, had his eyes somewhat open. He used to come to our Torah study, and yet he was a big, a big macha, as we used to call it, in the, in the church. And, you know, and he, had, he had a Saturday tennis game and whatever, and he just didn't want to give that stuff up. Because I said to him, I said, you, you, you're getting this so much. Why are you still in your church? Too much delusion still in there, you know? 
How much of the truth do you want? You know, it's like the, uh, you can't handle the truth. You want the truth or you don't want the truth? Look, if you come to me, I'm only going to give you truth. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat or beat around it or anything else. So that's part of why sometimes people leave. They don't want it. All right? But you're not going to get any of that other nonsense coming out of the microphone from here anyway. Okay? And so, but anyway, so that was hopefully a long-winded way of answering the question. But you need to know that just leave people alone. I have, I've got a little in focus somewhere that says just leave them alone, Okay? Leave them alone. Leave people alone. Set, walk it out. Show them what it looks like. When their bubble gets burst, they'll think, oh, that person was doing some different things. Maybe I should ask them a question. Let them come to you when their bubble gets popped. Okay? Let them think of you as that little thought in the back of their mind, well, that's weird that they chose to go that way. Well, and if you're walking it out and setting a good example, they just may come to you looking for some answers. And then be smart. Don't answer the questions that you're not really qualified to answer. Send them to the teacher or the teaching. Okay? Say, that's a great question. And when I had that question, this teaching helped me. Or this teacher helped me or whatever. Don't get yourself in trouble thinking you have to answer the question. I'm not telling you you can't. I'm just saying don't unless you really feel like you're comfortable. Because once you do, you're now responsible for being in the position of a teacher. And if you're wrong and don't express it correctly, that's on you. All right? Church taught you the opposite. You need to tell everybody everything and blah, 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 because you're responsible. Only people who are trained and qualified are responsible or should be doing it, and that's because it's their responsibility to do it. If you do it, now you've, you've taken on your, that role. You're, you're, you're risking the responsibility. All right, go ahead, Rob. This way, you, what you just said just kind of reminded me of what I, on, I had let, marked it down as kind of a comment question on 712, and it, or the kind of the if and then statement it says it shall be because you hear these right rulings you should guard them and do them and Yahweh is is like you said I, I can read this or I can tell somebody about it but it's better to let the teacher and you as our teacher I've read this probably a hundred times I never until you I hear it from you and the people are hearing it from Boshe that's hearing it from Yahweh so I, I, I equate I'm you as telling us is, or you instructing us, and, and we're hearing the words through you so, I mean, as a teacher. Look, and also let's take it to what I've been telling you when I went back to the Father and the Son thing. What did we talk in the Father and the Son teaching? That he has to give you eyes to see and ears to hear. So he says, and it shall be because you hear, which means he had to give them ears to hear, because you hear, these things, you guard and do them, then these other things will happen. But it doesn't mean that the, the information vibrationally came out of somebody's mouth and moved into your physical thing called an ear and you heard the words. He's talking about those that have ears to hear. So you do not have a responsibility to have people actually just hear anything by the sound coming out of your mouth. If they can't receive it, it was a wasted breath. Okay? Just allow them to journey until he opens their eyes and pokes their bubble. And you know what it's like because when he poked yours, you went on a relentless journey needing to know. You had a, that, that itch that needed to be scratched and you had to figure out, I got to figure this out. And I've heard lots of people like Mark say, and I read and I studied every day and every day. And I, you know, Mandy got to the point where he was pretty much done. And that's when he always said, okay, here it is. All right. Because it could be a frustrating journey because there's not a lot of places to go and actually find truth. You know? And so you can get to the point where, like, look, if you're not going to give this to me, then just leave me alone. Let me go. <laughs> That's the way he put it. I mean, stop torturing me. Either give me what I need so I can have the answers and find you or release me. That's the hunger that's there. Okay? Now, if that person you're talking to is as happy as can be in their walk, whatever they're doing, all you're going to do is get a violent response or disturb their peace or whatever. I've mentioned this an awful lot, but when I talk to people, and some of you wonder, I wonder how many people Rabbi saved. I didn't save anybody. Neither did you, by the way. Okay? Well, how many people do you think he brought to all this? I don't, only through the teachings that people found him. When I talk to people personally, zero. 
Because I start the conversation off, and it usually starts off with them asking, well, what I do or something. Someone might say, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm a messianic rabbi. And like, what's that? And I explain. And then they want to ask more questions. And I say, before I get too deep into it, I simply ask them, well, how's your walk? Oh, I'm just, I'm just blessed and this and that and, you know, walking in favor and whatever. And, well, I don't know. I couldn't be happy. My church is awesome. Well, guess what? I am going to change the subject as quick as I can and leave them alone. Because no good is coming out of that conversation. Okay? Unless I want to argue Paul all day. Okay? There's nothing good coming out of that. Now, if they tell me, well, you know, actually I'm kind of frustrated and I'm kind of not sure what's going on and, you know, I feel like something's missing or I feel like something's wrong. Now, that doesn't mean they're ready, but they might be. So I might just sort of throw something out there to see where they're at and maybe point them towards the website or the teachings and say, you may want to check this out. Some of you are thinking, ooh, ooh, I got one, and you want to reel them on in and get out your harpoon and you know, spear them down or something, you know. Mount them up on your wall. Just vomit everything you know at them. Don't do that. Who knows? They just may be disturbed. and Maybe they're just in a church. They don't like it. They just need a different church. They're still in the wrong place. I mean, I, there's almost not a single one of you that I've met that's, that's in the same denomination you started in by the time you came to this. You changed three or four times. Well, you know, I was born a Catholic, and then I ended up a Baptist, and I ended up in a Pentecostal church for a little bit, and I went, I mean, that's what everybody's story sounds like. I was this, and then I was this, and then I was, well, because you were looking for something. Well, they may still be church hopping and not ready for this, okay? But they're not happy where they're at. So just because they're unhappy doesn't mean they're ready for this. So don't think, oh, got to ask more questions. Let them ask more questions. See where they're at, okay? And resist the urge to vomit all over them, all the stuff like you're all excited, you know? You're not helping anything. All right, next question. From Joseph Neal, in regards to Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 7, 5, should we burn books we have that are written by people in Christianity? All right, look, you don't have to literally do these things anymore as far as, like, books and things. This is literally talking about the pagan uh, shrines and place, temples of worship and that kind of thing. Okay, just get rid of them, throw them out. You know, if you want to burn them, you can burn them. If you want to blow them up, if you want to take them out for target practice, it doesn't. Do, I know people have done all those things, okay? Okay, just be rid of it. Um, as far as the Christian books and all those kind of things, you know, if you want to get rid of them, get rid of them. I mean, I've got, you know, all kinds of eclectic sort of collection of things on my bookshelf, but that's because I have to know where people are coming from and where they've been and what's going on. And so I've got every kind of different translation of the Bible on there. I've got the Book of Mormon. I've never read it, but in case somebody actually wants to question that, I've got a bunch of the Adventist books in case people want to question with me. So I've got stuff, but that's because it's a reference library for me as the rabbi. Okay, if I was you sitting there, I wouldn't have, you know, necessarily keep all of these things. Okay, so if, if you have anything that disturbs you, definitely get rid of it. Anything you're not comfortable, get rid of it. Okay. All right. But you don't have to burn it necessarily. The garbage will be more than sufficient. Toss it in the can and let it go out with the rest of the garbage. Olivier and Jenna Hoffman. It's Rabbi chapter 7, 12, 13. Are the curses and blessings are only for the covenant Israel? How can I help someone who is not covenanted, who believes in being cursed by God? Um, Janet, you'll have to talk to me about that. We'll have to deal with that more in an individual sort of what the more, more detail of what you're talking about. Okay? Um, you got to remember that there's a difference between Elohim and the God of this world. And the God of this world uses the same tools that the true Elohim uses to try to manipulate. Okay, Elohim isn't manipulating, but the, the false one tries to manipulate. And he uses what, he lo what looks like blessing and cursing to manipulate. Okay? Whereas Yahweh is using it to instruct and so, but you also got to remember that Christianity has tried to teach us about curses. And they've done that, for the most part, in a very poor way. All right? So I'm sure you're going to, Janet does counseling, so I'm sure you're going to run into people that feel that they are cursed. 
Sometimes it's just an excuse for not dealing with stuff that you just have refused to deal with. So, of course, it seems like a curse. You keep doing the same dumb thing over and over again and to get the same dumb result, instead of recognizing that you're doing the same dumb thing over and over again, it's easier to say, well, I'm cursed. Mm, maybe not. Okay? Look, I, I could have thought I was cursed. As a matter of fact, my wife thought I was cursed at one point. <laughs> well, no, seriously, because when we got married, and I would have a job, and then it would look like it was going great, and then all of a sudden some bizarre thing, literally a bizarre thing would happen to wipe out whatever I was doing. And this happened four or five times in a row. She's like almost joking, like, I don't know, maybe you're cursed. I mean, what's going on? Now, but what was it? It was Yahweh saying, if I let you be too successful in this, I'll never get you to where you're going to do this. Okay? And so... Because of my work ethic, because of the whatever gifts and talents I have in business, I was always able to be successful quickly. And I, if I had done that, I would, have, I would have made high six figures in plus doing any of those things that I was doing. And I would have been very happy and satisfied and had a family and all the, the trappings of life. And why would I ever do this? But he kept taking those away so that by the time I was offered an opportunity to, come, opportunity to come into this, by the way, that opportunity to come into this came the same day that I lost that last job before coming into this. Of course, interestingly enough, I fired myself, but that's besides the point. I did, actually. Because um, I was the CFO of the company and I did the books and realized that the company couldn't afford me. When the, when the owner said, well, what do I need to do to fix the books? Said, well, first of all, all the rest of you are on commission. I'm the only one on salary. You can't afford me when we don't have enough business going on. I said, first of all, you got to get rid of me. you got to get rid of half the staff and start just with the two of you all over again from scratch. And so I went home, and my wife said, how was your day? He said, it was great. I fired myself. <laughs> Not everybody can say that. But that same day, I got a phone call that night offering me a part-time Torah teacher job in a congregation in Knoxville that started this journey, okay? Now, I don't have these dumb jobs going on if any one of them was allowed to just be successful and not have all those weird things happen to them and everything else, all right? Like an example, like when I met my, met my wife, I was making easily $7,000 a month as a commodities broker. I just bought a nice Mustang convertible, was living the life. And then this thing called El Nino. El Nino is a weather pattern that changes the way everything all works. Wiped out everybody's usual patterns of what they expect the crops to do and the other things to do. And things weren't harvesting exactly the right way because after all the weather pattern messed everything up. And so people were losing all their money, and so I did not have any more of the clients. They lost all their money. Not all of it, but a bunch of it. Now, this wasn't clients that were necessarily following my advice. I mean, I was managing people's accounts, but they were making their choices based on the predictable patterns that normally happen. And so I went from about seven, dollars $8,000 a month to $1,500 a month in about three months. Well, that kind of changed things. And that would happen everywhere I went. I'd be very successful quickly. And so, but just understand that it may look like a curse. It just might mean that you don't have enough perspective yet to know what it is. Because that certainly could look like a curse. I was very frustrated. I would get quick success everywhere I went, only to have something weird happen. <laughs> okay? And that was just what was going on. And I, you can imagine that if you had married me and if you're very quickly wondering, what in the world's going on here, you know? Okay? But it was to lead to this. And so this, we've been, you know, I've never done anything this long with this much success because this is where he's trying to get me to be. All right? So when we talk about curses, a lot of it's just what it appears to you. It's not necessarily going to fall into that category. All right, that was a long-winded way of answering a question I said I wasn't going to answer. Did you all catch that? Okay. Anyway, anything else? Uh, last one from, from Vaskin. It says, Deuteronomy 7.3, I've come to realize that I now don't want to marry anyone from the world. Rabbi... Is it best to only marry someone with an MTOI body? What about if there's no one like that where, where we are right now? 
All right. First of all, I like that the last question is coming from the future. Because Vaskin is in Australia, <laughs> where it's already tomorrow. Okay, so um, look, first of all, you have to go back to your emunah, okay? You're not trusting that Yahweh can bring you or her to where you are, or you to where she is. He's got a plan. He can do whatever, okay? So don't you know, doubt what he can do. Now, the first part of what you said is absolutely true. The last thing you want, and trust me, I counsel a lot of people who are now in that unequally yoked place, that is the last thing you want, okay? And you definitely do not want to get married to someone who's been in this for five seconds and you've been in it for 10 seconds, okay? All right, you've got to figure this out and find somebody that they're already in this because they're in the covenant. And then you're also in the covenant and then you find each other and marry somebody on the same walk, because you do not want to marry somebody. I have a friend that married somebody, many, this is many, many years ago, who you know, convinced him that she was coming into this walk for all the right reasons, but really she just wanted him. And then once they said, I do, she said, I don't, to the walk. And then they ended up divorced because it was a nightmare. Okay, and of course he had gotten counsel beforehand but wouldn't listen which is why everybody I counsel for marriage, I tell them, until you get married, you need to be open to not getting married. Don't miss all the telltale signs, because a lot of you that have bad marriages, you can go back and look at all the telltale signs that you missed and you should have been paying attention to, and that's why you're struggling now. That's not why you should get divorced or anything, just to understand, okay? That when you're dating, you tend to ignore a lot of stuff. When you get married, all of a sudden, you don't ignore it anymore. <laughs> okay? And so you need to pay attention to that. And so I tell people, don't let yourself, you know, well, we've been dating for this time, and so that doesn't mean you have to finish by getting married. But let's make sure that we're trying to, you get covenanted, and then find someone who's covenanted. Okay? Already covenanted. Because if they're covenanting for you, this is a recipe for absolute delusional disaster. You're deluding yourself. Or they could be genuine and deluding themselves, trying to convince, because they think they're doing it for themselves when really they're only doing it for you. Okay? Not a good way to start. Okay, Vaskin? So yes, I would say your best advantage is to find someone with the same teacher. Because then you know you're on the same page. You want to marry somebody who has the same teacher. Now, of course, if you don't have a teacher and they don't have a teacher, that's one thing. That's already a, a potential chance to have all kinds of problems. But you need to do what thing. If you're the man especially, but even if you're the woman too, if you have found your teacher, then you want to find a man or the woman, whatever, that has the same teacher. Because then you know you're on the same And not only that, if you have a teacher and you respect that teacher in the vertical structure and your husband or your wife, whichever one you are, are getting married and you both have the same authority structure, guess what? You have a problem. You have someone you can go to that your spouse will respect. Because I counsel, hey. I counsel a lot of people who say, well, because they're, they're, I'm their teacher, but their spouse is not in the same relationship with me. And they want me to do something. I said, I can't do anything because your spouse is not in this vertical alignment. So I have no leverage there. Because leverage comes from their submission, respect, etc., voluntarily given. Right? I have no leverage but what is voluntarily given to me to have leverage. Okay, I can't force anybody to do anything. But if you honor and respect that position in the vertical alignment, you may then be willing to have me say, you need to knock it off. You need to treat her better. You need to treat him better. You need to do this. You may listen to that. But if only one of you is submitted, the other one's not going to listen. So I would say... To really take the unequally yoke, take it what it literally is talking about. Do not be with someone under a different yoking. Yoking is discipling a teacher. Marry somebody with the same teacher. All those of you that are married and you're here with your spouse and you both have me as your teacher, you are in a yoked, equally, equally yoked position and you know that there's a blessing in that. Because if you have a problem, you can both come and talk and you're both going to hear with the same amount of respect from the same person trying to help you. 
If you're not equally yoked, you have none of that. There's no leverage. There's nothing you can do. I talk to spouses all the time. We're like, oh, but my wife won't come to you or my husband won't come to you. I say, well, then there's nothing I can do. That's the way it is. And you can't make them just come to me because they, if, even if they came to a session with me, if they don't respect me in that position, I still have no leverage. There's nothing I can do to say, hey, listen, I love both of you. I want you both to be successful. You need to listen to the counsel, the wisdom of the counsel. There's no leverage to do that. I mean, I mean, okay, is that it, Rob? We're good. Okay. <laughs>